Okay, so last time we talked about Adaline, if you remember, and we said that we are using Adaline for uh, classification. So assuming that we have two classes and we have our data scattered like that, we could draw like a decision boundary between them to be able to separate these uh, two data sets. And we also last time uh, showed that we can get the equation of this uh, decision boundary and we can um, like separate uh, our data. And we have also seen how we are doing this. So we basically have a cost function and then we can uh, do take the derivative of that cost function and then we change uh, the weights uh, accordingly. So basically we had this cost function And then we can take the derivative of that cost function, which is the slope. And then we started iterating with that slope and updating our weights until we try to reach the global minima in that weight cost uh, relationship uh, curve. Okay. And we said also that the other line is different from the perceptron and that the perceptron is acting on every sample. This means that the perceptron is updating the weight with every sample. So if we assume that we have our weight transpose vector and we multiply this with our data x in order to get our net input z, then we would see that in perceptron, we are multiplying with the first sample. And after doing that, we are calculating z and then we are calculating y hat and from that we are getting the error we are getting the error and then we are updating our w with the value of uh, the slope or the derivative of that error okay on the other hand in other line we are not doing this so in perception we were updating with every sample but in other line we were updating with the whole a batch we say that this is a batch okay so we are updating with our whole data set okay we're taking our data set as the whole uh, batch so we have a w transpose we have x and then we are getting z by multiplying them so the thing is we would multiply all of these elements until we get a vector like that one by samples, okay, and then that vector would be uh, going to an activation function which was linear in the case of the other line. So we basically took z and we mapped it to 5z without changing the value in any way so that 5z will be y hat and then we calculated the error and then we uh, updated uh, the weights so we would say that the difference between them would be that the weight update and other line is using the whole data set on the other hand with the perceptron it's just using uh, every uh, sample okay so do you have any questions in anything in the previous um, lectures or uh, algorithms that we talked about yeah okay perfect so right now we will introduce some new terms so some of them are very very important in supervised learning and machine learning in general okay and then we will talk about uh, logistic regression so let's start by assuming that we have a data set we have two features x1 and x2 okay and we have the true labels so we have the class and then we collected a lot of data sets like that okay and what we were doing so far we were using the whole data set and we were scattering these points and then we were trying to come up with the separating line okay but we actually need to do something 
a little bit different. Our goal, our ultimate goal is to see if we have something that is unseen, if we have a data point that we don't know, if we have a data point, a new data point that is scattered in this part, would this be belonging to this class or the other class? So we are really interested in classifying a new data, a new sample that is unseen. Okay. So we can now call what we were doing in this part, like getting the whole data set and trying to get the model or trying to get the decision boundary that would separate the classes, we would say that this is our training training phase. Okay. We are calling this training because you are training your classifier model. Okay, you have some data samples for which you know the true label and you are trying to train your model. You are trying to get the model to adapt to this kind uh, of data. Okay, so we call this our uh, training phase. Okay, so right now we can just, let's erase this and just separate this and say that this could be called the testing phase. The part when you plug in a lot of samples and you really, really don't know the true um, identity of them. Of course, you know the true class. Of course, you know that this is one, one and this is minus one and minus one. But you just need to take them and test your classifier, okay? To know how well this classifier is doing, okay? So to do this, right now we have, as I said, separated the training phase from the testing phase. And right now we need to do some evaluation to our classifier. Okay, we need to really evaluate the performance of the classifier. So how would we go on and evaluate the performance of our classifiers? We can take something very um, easy like the accuracy. Okay, the accuracy is very intuitive and very easily implemented. So what we can do is basically take the unseen samples. Let's say that we have 100 unseen uh, sample. Okay, so we take all of them and then we'll plug in each one of them and go and see what would the classifier produce. Because let's say that these are ones and these are minus ones. Okay, and this unseen sample is the one here. So this is our sample. Then basically we know that the true label is one. Okay, for this sample. So when we plug in this into the classifier and we try to see the true label or the predicted label from the classifier, it would be minus one because it just sees that this point is falling underneath uh, the line. Okay, so the predicted value is minus one, which is different from one. Okay, so we say that this is a misclassification. Okay, so we go on on our unseen samples and we perform the same thing. We project all of our samples on the classifier, okay, and see the predicted and the true. So this would be the true, this would be the predicted, and then we'll go ahead and compare each one of them. Okay, and the accuracy would be simply how many hits do we have? How many correct, correct predictions? Okay, correct predictions over the total number of samples that we have. So let's say that we got 90 of them correct meaning that the predicted matches the true label, then we would have 90 out of 100. So we have 90%. Uh, so we just multiply this by 100. Okay, so we have 90% accuracy. Okay. Okay, cool. So this is a way to really go ahead and evaluate our classifiers. Then how would would we project this data onto our model, 
into our classifier. The idea is so simple, like we were doing uh, during training. If you remember during training, we were calculating Z, which is W transpose X plus D bias. Okay. And then we calculated 5Z in the other line, which is Z. Okay. And then we said that this is Y hat. This is our predicted uh, data. Okay. This is our predicted label. Similarly, we will do the same here. So when we are trying to project something unseen, let's say this sample, we would basically substitute this sample into X. So we basically take uh, the final weights that we get from the training uh, phase and the bias that we get from the training phase. And then we would go ahead and calculate Z by using this W and bias, okay, into the same equation. But this X right now is for the unseen uh, data. Okay, and then we we'll go ahead and calculate Z, and then 5Z, and then the uh, predicted uh, class. Okay, so do you have any questions on that? Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. So now we really would like to think about what would happen if we have some parameters that we want to optimize. Okay, so if you remember, we had this uh, parameter eta, which is called the learning rate. That we can vary, basically. So we can take different values for this learning rate. And if we make the value of the learning rate very high, this could be a problem because if the value of the learning rate is very high, this would lead us to overshoot the global minima. So we would just go ahead and go in different directions and we would totally miss uh, the global minima. In the meantime, if we make the value of eta very small, if we make it very small, so something like 0.001, something like that, then you would be taking very small steps towards the global minima and you could exhaust the number of epochs, the number of iterations that you have before reaching the global minima. So this is also is a big issue, okay? So we really need something in between. We really need like a compromise between the two. So what would happen? How would we go ahead and choose a value that could range from this to this? How would we try to come up with a solution to this uh, problem? Okay, so something that is really handy is this procedure. We start by naming any parameter like that, that is really uncertain. So it's a parameter that we need to get the value for and we need uh, to know the optimal value of. We call such parameters, we call them hyper uh, parameters. Okay, for eta, we can call it just a parameter that we need to optimize, but hyperparameters mean, means in general that we have some general parameters, like let's say the number of samples or something like that. So we have very general parameters that govern the behavior of our uh, classifier model. Okay, so people came up with a very nice idea. They said, okay, Let's try to do our training phase. Let's do our training multiple times with different eta uh, values, okay? So they said that, okay, we are very uncertain about the exact value of eta that we uh, should uh, pick. So we could say that, okay, let's start from this value. Let's range and try this one. Let's also try this one. And let's try this one. Okay. And they said, okay, let's for every time we change the value of our eta, of our parameter, we go ahead and see the performance of our uh, classifier model. Okay. So this performance of our classifier model is a little bit different from the testing phase. 
because the testing phase means that you have some unseen sample. We really don't want to go ahead and touch the testing set at any point right now, because what we are doing here, we are trying to optimize, to optimize, okay, optimize our parameter. And when you are optimizing your parameter, this would mean that you want to get the optimal value for eta. Okay, and when you get the optimal value for eta, then you would use this particular value to do a test it with the testing set. Okay, so what we really need to do is to come up with an idea on how to get the best value for eta just using the training set without touching the testing set. Okay, and people came up with a lot of ideas. So some people take an idea and just they adopted this approach and said, okay, let's split our data into equal parts. So let's split our data into 50% and 50%, okay? And we would name this 50% our training, our training set, and we would name the other 50%, we would name them validation. Okay, so now that's a new term. Okay, so let's now differentiate between training and validation and testing. So from the huge training set that you have, you can split your data into training and validation for the sake of optimizing some parameters or doing some optimization. Okay, or just testing your classifier despite um, having a testing set. Okay. So we would basically split our data 50%, okay, 50-50, 50 for training and 50 for uh, validation. And the way we would uh, test our data with this validation is like the accuracy. So you basically go ahead and see if we train our classifier with the 50, let's say 50% 50 of samples, and we come up with the separating line, and then we plug in those, and see how many of them are classified correctly and how many of them are uh, misclassified and then we get our accuracy measure, okay? So let's say that we plug in our first eta value, this value, and this gave us um, 0.7, meaning that it gives, it gives 70%, okay? So we can go ahead and put this value here and then we would go ahead and try to do the whole training again with the new value of eta, okay? And let's say that this gave us 80%. And let's say this was also 70%, and this one gave us 60%. Uh, percent. Okay, such that we would have like a curve. We can connect these points like so and say, okay, when we change the value of eta, we get this uh, performance, okay? Right now, you can go ahead and say, all right, now I know that from the training self alone, from the training self alone, I was able to test different values for eta, and I know that this value give me the highest accuracy on the training set. So um, I would really be tempted to just take this value for eta, okay, and say that this is my optimal eta. I would use this to do my training. And so I will just take this value for eta, okay, and I will repeat my training. I will repeat my training phase, but really notice this part that right now after taking the value of eta, I'm not gonna split my data into 50% training and validation because that's it, I have used the validation and I don't need it anymore. I will just take this value, okay? And I will do my training using the whole training set, okay? So I will use the whole training set and now I know my optimal eta and I will finish my training phase and I then will use uh, my testing uh, data, okay? So, do you have any questions uh, in this part? Mm. Okay, good. So, uh, we can just 
take this into the next slide. So let's save this one. Okay, let's try to take this into the next slide and talk more about it because thinking about the data again, that's our data and that's our class. So that's the true label. And we have a lot of samples like so. Really thinking about this again, we would say that we don't have like a, a perfect way of uh, saying that we should be doing this kind of splitting into 50% and 50%. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like a must, right? Because someone else could say, okay, let's take 70, 30. And this would be totally uh, valid. Okay. Way to do this. So people were really trying to think about like a general way or a standard way of splitting uh, our data. And that's when we um, are introduced to a concept called cross cross validation. Cross validation is a very handy way of splitting our data, and then we can use this to uh, do our training in a meaningful way, and also try to uh, optimize the values of our uh, hyperparameters. So with the cross validation, we pick a value. So we say that this is belonging to a key fold cross validation, cross validation. Okay. And we pick a value for this key, for this fold. Okay. So if we take the value of this fold to be two, k equals two, this would mean that you are splitting your data into two folds. Okay two folds. So you have one fold for training and one fold for uh, validation. Okay. And if we increase this to something else, let's say five, then you have five folds. This would mean that you have five folds in your data. So it would be something like this. Okay. And what this means, so let's say that we take this example, okay, the example of the five uh, folds. If we imagine that our data is just representing 100, 100 samples, then by taking five folds, this would mean that we take basically uh, our 100% of data or 100 samples, okay, we divide it by five. If we divide this by five, that will give us 20 samples. Okay. And we always take one of these folds for validation. Okay. Okay. So one for uh, validation. So again, we said that it will be five uh, fools. So you basically would split your data into five parts, okay, like I'm doing here, and then I will use four of them for training and one of them for validation. Okay, so let's imagine that we said we will use 10 fools, 10 fool the cross validation. Okay, this would mean that we are splitting our data into 10 parts, okay? And then you will use nine of them for training and you will use one of them for validation. Is this clear? Yes. Okay, perfect. So every time you are doing this, you are splitting your data into different parts and you are just having one of them for validation and the other uh, segments for uh, the other ports for uh, training okay so if we have our data like that it's very it's very common to think about this and say just okay take the first 90 samples for training and then the lift out 10 samples for uh, validation but the thing is the order of the data doesn't really matter it doesn't really make anything um 
like any meaningful uh, thing about the data. So it's called the cross validation because we are doing this in a in a cross validation way, meaning that you if when you take this as your validation fault, okay, the first iteration, you will get an accuracy, right? Because you are training with these 90 samples and then testing with this. So you would get an accuracy. And we say that this is the accuracy of the first of the first training fold of the first fold okay and then in the second iteration we start changing the location of this validation uh, set okay so instead of taking the port uh, that we highlighted we can take this as our validation okay and then we take this port and also this part as training okay so the green the green areas is for the second iteration so now we are changing the location of our validation okay and we get accuracy for the second fold okay and then you go ahead and repeat this several times until you finish all the locations for the validation so in this example we had five locations right so the validation would start here and then here 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 right so we'd have how many how many cross validation folds how many of these accuracy of these accuracies would we have and it's 45 folds or 45 so we would have five right because we are repeating this five times because we are changing the location of our validation set right mm -hmm. and we have five fools so we have split our data into uh, five uh, ports and each one of them would have an accuracy okay and then we say that our final accuracy from training is the mean it's the average of the accuracies from B5 fools. Okay. And this would be our accuracy from the training phase. Okay. So right now we can think about each one of these in the same way. Because remember, now we had eta and we were splitting our data 50 50. And we got our accuracy from the training phase. So we were training with the training set and then testing with the validation set. If we adopt the similar approach of the cross validation, and let's say that we have five fools. So instead of doing 50 50, we have five fools. Then we would have five accuracies. And then we take the average of them for a particular value of eta. So we would have like five values okay and this point in bold is like the average of them okay and that's the average of the cruise uh, validation uh, foods okay okay perfect so you go ahead and repeat this if you do 50 50 you don't have a lot of variations you don't have variations if you have five foods you have five points and then you take the average of them and that's how we can build up this kind of curve uh, right here okay okay this is called a validation validation curve so this concept is really handy because right now if you have any sort of parameter that you really don't know that you really don't know the optimal value for you can just take different values for this parameter and go ahead and do cross validation and then assess the performance of your classifier and see the optimal value uh, for this uh, hyperparameter okay okay so we can uh, even go further and think about uh, some other stuff like uh, what would happen uh, if we think about some 
uh, problems in our uh, classifiers. So let's say that we have a classifier model. We could really think about two kinds of issues that could happen with our classifier model. So our classifier model could suffer from something called overfitting or something called under fitting okay so we might have our data looking like that overfitting would basically mean that our classifier is trying to draw a boundary that looks like that it's very overfitting with our data it's really like memorizing okay memorizing the data just memorizing the data points and this could happen as a result of having a lot of features okay or just the classifier model is so complex on the training set such that it caused this overfitting uh, to happen okay so overfitting is a big issue in the meantime underfitting is also an issue underfitting is having a classifier that draws a decision boundary that looks like that this decision boundary doesn't mean anything it's really bad because this decision boundary means that the classifier was not able to train on our data it's really just picking any any value and it's not really adapting to our data in any uh, meaningful way okay so what we really need to have is something in between we really need to get this compromise between underfitting and overfitting okay and we go ahead and call this overfitting we call it high variance okay and the problem of underfitting we call it high bias okay so we really need to think of a way to have a classifier that doesn't suffer from overfitting or underfitting we really need something that uh, that is in between okay that has a good balance uh, between the two okay and we will see how to do this we can um, prevent overfitting using something called the regularization and we would see how to do regularization perhaps not today but we would tackle this uh, issue okay and we can also see uh, what to do uh, about having uh, underfitting okay so we have seen uh, the validation curve and we have just very briefly introduced ourselves to overfitting and underfitting that we have two issues we still don't know how to deal with them but we just know that we have these two uh, problems that we need to uh, prevent when uh, uh, getting our classification model okay so uh, okay so let's say that right now we know the validation curve so basically our validation curve will look like that we have a parameter and then we have different values for this uh, parameter okay and we can pick um, the highest of them okay you can pick the highest value okay in the meantime we have something else that is called the learning learning curve the learning curve is a little bit different the learning curve would see the progression of our accuracy so we would still have accuracy on the y-axis but the difference is that on the x-axis of the learning curve we have the number of samples so basically we have our data we have our samples okay 
and we need to know what would happen if we increase the number of samples if we add more samples into the training would that increase our performance or would this harm our performance and it should be it should be good because it's adding more variations to our data more variation to our data so it should be uh, somehow something beneficial to have more uh, data okay because then the classifier is exposed to more data of the same class such that it can really learn uh, better the the features and how they are scattered in the feature space okay so right now we can just draw this we can have our number of samples and see when we increase our number of samples what would happen to the performance of the classifier of course in practice this is not linear if you increase this this would not increase like uh, forever okay so you would have like a maximum uh, increase you would have like a maximum accuracy uh, after which you wouldn't really gain much by adding more and more uh, samples okay so it's really nice because we can then take this curve and say that this is our training training set curve meaning that we have used our training data so let's try to erase this part and make it a little bit clearer okay so we had our training data and I was using the whole training data to get my accuracy so in this part I was not using validation so I basically trained my classifier on the training set and I tested my classifier again on the same data and that's how I would get this training set curve right here and then I get the curve by just changing the number of samples every time so I add an, a lot of samples I add more samples and then I get the accuracy at every at every time okay and then we can we can plot another curve in the same figure which would be handy because looking at this other curve we would be able to interpret some meaningful uh, and have some meaningful insights into our data so let's say that we had our training uh, curve looking like that and let's say that we have like a ceiling for the accuracy let's say that this was 90 percent and this 90 percent is really really high in the context of our uh, data in this particular um, application in this particular example I would say that 90 percent is actually a very high accuracy okay what will happen if we see that this accuracy is like that for the training set okay but then we see that there is a huge gap between them like that if we have this to be our uh, validation okay we might uh, see something like that okay we might see uh, something like this we might see a huge gap between uh, our training and our uh, validation like this or we actually could have this uh, as a different example so let's say that this is not our validation let's say that this is this actually could be it could be a testing as well okay so let's just try to put different examples in the same figure and think about them so that's our training set okay so what would happen if we find that our validation curve is looking like that do you think this would mean that the classifier is good or is it a bad classifier so what do you think what? would this classifier be a good classifier if we have this training curve and validation curve very perfectly aligned uh, together like that or it's a bad classifier that's good it's a good classifier right because this would mean that we had our training data 
and this training data is actually generalizable on the validation as well so we can train our classifier and we can validate our classifier with the validation set and the accuracy is almost the same right so yeah. this is actually very good okay so this example is something that we that we want okay okay so let's take the other example that i was drawing in the beginning but I think it will be clearer right now. So this example right here. Now, this is our validation. Okay, this is our validation. But there is an issue with this, okay? There is an issue with this. If you look at this, you would notice a huge gap between the two, right? So this would mean that the training set is very good. We are getting 90%, we are getting the accuracy that we were aiming for. But the validation set is like 50% or 60%. So this is not really good because the higher this gap, this would mean that we would have overfitting. We would have overfitting because you are building a model with the training data, with the training set, but this model is not generalizable to the part you left out for validation okay that's why it was getting a poor performance for the validation set okay yeah. okay perfect so let's draw another example a different example so let me so i want to ask a question um sure. the validation and test set are they the same no so uh, how we are using them is quite similar in this context, okay? But in practice, they are different. So I will try to explain the difference here. So we have a training set, okay? And we have a testing set, okay? The training set is what you collected during the training phase, okay? The testing set is some unseen samples that should not be involved in the training phase by any means okay they should be left out until you get the accuracy of the classifier and that's it you cannot use them to optimize the values of the hyperparameters okay then how about the validation set the validation set is merely a subset of the training set okay that we call the validation so how could we go ahead and, and, and use it? We use it like the testing set. We use it like the testing set, okay? But just to test the classifier during the training phase. Okay? okay. So again, the testing set is something that you do not touch until the testing phase, until the end, okay? But the validation is just a part of the training that it you, that is used to optimize the hyperparameters, okay? or perhaps get an idea of how well you are performing on the training set using the validation, okay? Oh. Okay, cool. So, uh, we can then go ahead and think about the other problem. So, we have seen overfitting, right? We have seen overfitting using these uh, learning and validation curves. Okay, so just by changing this from learning curve to validation curve would mean instead of number of samples, we would have a parameter that we need to optimize. And then this would become a validation curve. Okay, and that's only the difference between them. So we have seen visually how overfitting looks like when you have something that is really, really good on the training set, but it's not very good on the validation, okay? Okay, how about, how about underfitting? How about underfitting? What do you think underfitting would look like visually? We try to visualize it. The validation would be zero. So the validation would be low, right? So how about the training with the training? So underfitting basically is the yellow line, right? So this would mean that you are not training very well. You have a, a bad model basically, right? Yeah. Okay. So underfitting, underfitting would mean that we would have our training bad, 
training model because it's also very far away from the optimal accuracy that we would like to have okay and it's also bad for the validation okay also bad for the validation set because it's very far from uh, the accuracy that we are aiming for okay so when you have a huge gap between uh, the uh, optimal accuracy and your training and also the validation then we would have high bias meaning that we have a model that is doing under underfitting okay so i think it's really nice because you would say and from this figure you would just be able to get one insight just seeing the uh, decision boundary just seeing the 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 line that separates the data and say okay this is not very good perhaps this is a high bias perhaps this is underfitting but with these curves it's very nice because every point on the curve is testing something different it's, it's testing a parameter okay or testing a number of samples okay so you can really get an idea of this high bias or underfitting that you are assuming is really true with every value of that parameter okay and it would be very easy to look at this uh, visually of course if the data is allowing us uh, to do that and if the data is clear enough okay so if you have a high gap between a good accuracy and your training and validation this would be underfitting this would be high bias if you have your training data performing very well but this there is a huge gap between it and the validation and of course uh, it will be a huge gap between it and the testing as well then this would be uh, overfitting okay okay so we really if we aiming for a good classifier we need some compromise between the two it was like the thing that we drew in the beginning we need something that performs well on the training and the validation is also closely aligned uh, to, to the training so the behavior is not changing much between training and validation and this should actually make sense because both of them are coming from the same distribution they should be um, having a similar uh, better okay <clears throat> 